This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Gavin, mate, thanks for coming in. No worries. Thank you for having me. Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up south. I grew up in uh, in Ingerding in the Shire. Yep. Um, and uh, up till when I was 19, I was a Shire boy and and uh, spent a year on the Gold Coast and uh, surfed. And So you went up for schoolies and just was like, I'm <laughs> staying. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, funny story. I never actually I never actually did schoolies. So, yeah, neither. Um, yeah, I, I went straight to work and uh, started off life as a plasterer, actually, when I first left school. Wow. So very, very different. Is that like your dad's out. company or a mate's no, company or something? No, it was a uh, uh, girlfriend at the time. Her neighbor was a plasterer and wanted an apprentice. And yeah. Thought, hey, everyone else in the Shire is a tradie, so uh, yeah, you know, why not? That's what you. That was the, kind of the right of right of passage. So it was, it was kind of that was the the path I took at the time, and worked yeah. out that really wasn't for me. Yeah, right. So how many uh, how many years did you last in oh, plastering? Uh, nine months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah, less, less than a year. And because I, I and I did some painting uh, at one stage, and you just get I don't know what it's like plastering. Just heaps of shit under your fingernails. Yep. Oh yeah. man, it's like washing yeah. your hands at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, the dust, oh. the the dust, the, the the plaster. Uh, you know, constant. Yeah, you, you don't you don't ever get away from it. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. And then, um, and so nineteen, you last nearly a year. Yep. Do you go into financial services at that stage? Yeah, pretty much. I uh, on the Gold Coast, I was working at Billabong and spent a bit of time with them as yeah, they uh, that only recently floated. I think when when I got up there and did some time working in the central sourcing area, so they had a lot of brands doing their own thing in every country, mm-hmm. and uh, they decided to bring it together and have one kind of was business that, model. Was that the decision that screwed them over? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, I think in terms of what they did around their brand and protecting their brand, I think it was a very smart thing to to bring it all together because you're getting different qualities mm-hmm. I think, yep. in, in every country everyone wanting to do their own thing. So I think bringing it together made a lot of sense. And, right. You, know, you kind of think about what we do in, in brand now, protecting your brand, making sure you're getting consistent service delivery. It kind of yes. makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, I think their issues came let out in the track where they were trying to break into a whole different – a whole number of different markets very, very quickly and yeah. and perhaps that was uh, the start of their downfall. Sure. Yeah, right. And so you um, plasterer, billabong. Yep. Where's financial services come in? Yeah, so when I, I, I worked uh, either side of the the, um, the time at billabong, I worked in a customs brokerage and a freight forwarding business mm-hmm. and uh, that was my entree into, you know, sitting at a desk and, mm-hmm. and working in a corporate environment Yeah, um, and then kind of, the billabong time came back, worked back at the customs brokerage, and it kind of wasn't as fulfilling as I would have would have hoped. Um, <laughs> no. And you know, I always had a thirst and a, and a passion for um, uh, finance. Yep. And you know, I always enjoyed it. I hadn't taken that traditional university route, and mm-hmm. then found myself at Royal and Sun Alliance in two thousand and. And one. Um, what did they do? Uh, Royal Sun Alliance was uh, the business that effectively merged, or sorry, uh, morphed into Astron. And, oh, right. Uh, yeah. So they, they were a UK based firm. Right. Um, and Royal Sun Alliance were, you know, they'd been in, in Australia for a very long time and they'd acquired groups like Tyndall, Liberty Life, Oceanic. So they were a big insurer. Yes. Um, and, you know, not too dissimilar to, I suppose, Tower or Tau. Yeah. And now, um, you know, kind of bringing in and, and buying. Lots of businesses along the way through acquisition, um, and uh, yeah, I rode the Promina wave, which was the parent company that that kind of uh, started as a result of them uh, listing in Australia, a separate entity, and then um, worked there uh, till two thousand six, uh, two thousand seven, sorry, and then went across to Macquarie when they started their life business and helped uh, with the start of that business. Yeah. Um, and then, um, did they have Active back then? No, Active. Active came about uh, not long before I left. So I worked. I kind of worked with a bunch of people in there on on that build for Active, which was right. which was pretty exciting. And then we took that to market. And then not long after that, I I went to uh, AMP uh, to help kind of rebuild their IFA. Yeah. New South Wales presence, and uh, I was uh, kind of the, the state manager of the IFA 
business over there. Wow. Initially selling kind of their, their risk to the IFAs and then we, yeah. we, we went out with Flexible Super and, and there was other products that followed and then through the merger of AXA, we took on more capability with North and uh, yeah, we, 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 my space was, was purely the, the IFA market. So that would, have been, that would have kept you pretty busy, man. It was busy. It was a yeah. busy, time, busy time. And then so during all this time, you're – are you doing much work with the corporate side of things? Uh, in, in a sense of corporate super? Yes. Yeah. So we, we always had an eye on the small corporate plans, um, you know, up to 30, 40 members and, right. and, and whatnot. Um, that was always kind of in, in, in a play that we were, we were looking at taking out a, a viable offering there. Um, when I was at um, Astron and obviously – uh, yeah, Astron have a have, have a have a legacy with you know, corporate super business as well through their Optimum products and, and all the rest, which has now morphed into um, their their new offering that they've 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 relaunched. Um, so there's always been a presence with corporate super and kind mm. of, and, and background on how to engage members in the mass space and. Um, and I suppose it was those learnings of understanding how the corporate space and how to engage in that corporate space. And, you know, AMP had no shortage of um, concepts and ideas and programs they were looking to roll out to engage. And um, that took me to, to meeting Mark um, through the AFA, actually, um, 10 years ago and kind of sharing ideas around what you do in the corporate space and all the rest. And that's when we started looking at you know, what we do in his business and how you would engage and what you would do if you had the ability to do so. And, yeah, we, we, we started uh, working together and we generated your wealth hub, which was the, which is the, one of the one of the businesses I look after now. And then, as a as a top line premise, what do you what do you feel that your wealth hub does better than everything else? Yeah, it's it's the ability to go into a workplace and give um, members or employees a safe place to. Um, talk about issues that they may not have been able to talk about before. And I think if you consider financial stresses within some, within everyone somewhere, somehow, um, in the workplace, people take that stress to work yep. um, without an outlet. And in, in a corporate environment, they take it to work where um, they have to kind of, you know, meander through their world knowing that the monkey's on their back or mm. whatever, whatever analogy you want to use. But... Um, in the workplace, you become less productive if you're financially stressed. There's lots of statistics and reports that talk about that. But yep. um, the downside of that is that the workplace becomes less productive with employees who are financially stressed. And you know, what we're able to do is go into the workplace with a face-to-face -face engagement, uh, a one-on-one -on -one, you know, uh, engagement with, with the group environment where people can ask questions. And you know, we, we had one yesterday uh, where we were working with a group and the majority of people who came along were people who were under 30. And it was really good to see so many enthusiastic people there who want mm. to learn about the basics of finance. Mm. Um, but, the, but the point of that is you know, we're able to have people ask questions in a safe environment where no question is a silly question or a, or a stupid question because quite typically other people want to ask that same question. So in, in, in going out and talking about it and sharing a lot of the basics of money, having a digital presence through our website that we can share and engage and direct people there so they can self-educate and self-learn, there's a whole series of low-cost solutions and, and special deals that we've been able to negotiate with different providers where people can go in and, and, and navigate themselves or they can you know, have their one-on-one -on -one or put their hand up and ask a question and, and move into an environment where it would be a traditional advice relationship. So there's something for everybody and, you know, whether it's, you know, a digital engagement, face-to-face -face engagement over the phone or, or whatever, there's, there's typically something for everyone. That's a really long answer. No, question, mate, it was but, such a good answer yeah. because, um, okay, so you've got digital for people who just want to go it alone. Yeah. You've got phone-based for the people who want a little bit of interaction yeah. and then you've got face-to-face -face for people who want the high-touch action. Do you have sort of any numbers off the top of your head, you know, round figures on what percentage of people fall into each of those three categories? Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, we typically see across the board about a 25% engagement. Yep. So in, in terms that's of our monthly engagement with our educational update, mm -hmm. the figure sits at a consistent 25% of the people mm -hmm. who are reading our articles very much, which right. by all accounts is, is a pretty good number. Right. Um, we typically see in a workplace about 50% of people come to a, a, an education session at some point throughout the year. So we're engaging right. a good number of people 
at a face-to-face -face level, of which you probably see about half again ask a question and engage in some way, of which half will sit down for a one-on-one -on -one and half will probably want to do something and take action. Yeah. So, so in, in that sense, you know, you, you, you kind of, you're able to appeal to the masses with a broad message. Yes. And then through questions and, and messages that you're presenting in the sessions uh, or in your education updates, you're able to, you know, weed out the people who may have taken that had their thirst quenched and moved on to the next step. Mm. Um, but then you've got the people who obviously need the support. Yes. Um, we, we know that 20% of people are going to engage in a financial advice relationship and there's 80% largely who, who don't. It's, yeah. it's not that they want to have their head in the sand. We certainly wouldn't think that they purposely do that, but it's just too hard. And, you know, as a, as a financial advice profession and, and the broader finance industry, you know, we don't make it easy sometimes and, and that's, that's, that's troubling. Yeah. And it means that people who are financially stressed, back to my first point about taking stress in the workplace, they don't feel like that there's an easy way for them to obtain the answers. There's not choice around where you can turn. And we'd like to think as a value proposition, your wealth hub enables people to consider choices. And if people have choices, they feel more confident and comfortable to make a decision because mm. they know that I've got no, I don't have nowhere to turn. I have somewhere and I have a number of options I can choose. Yeah. So. In terms of the segments of where best people like to, um, you know, where they like to, to look, I, I don't have the specific areas about what what number of people actually sit in which box, but what I do know is is that through this kind of mass approach, having messages that appeal to everybody, we can then kind of cut those segments down based on the different demographics that kind of want to go through. So if people are interested about getting on top of their credit card debt, they don't know how, We'll talk to people about that. If they want to understand how to prepare for retirement, we talk about that. Um, the emerging kind of theme of, of ladies, people who have um, parents who are moving into aged care facilities and understanding what's that all about. Right. Um, so you kind of weed out these different groups as you kind of travel through different messages. And, and then – are you getting experts or experts yeah. to write these articles for you or are you guys doing this internally? Yeah, a combination of both. We know our skill set. You know, yep. our, the people who work you know, for your Wealth Hub are either financial advisors and, or they're people who have been involved in different aspects of a traditional financial advice relationship. So their expertise mm. in creating a, a layman's term um, uh, article or a story or a presentation means that we can kind of move down areas that are close to our heart. Yep. But we have a we have you know a, a community of specialist businesses that sit around us to mm. fill in the gaps. So aged care specialists, we have a relationship with Care Three Hundred and Sixty. We have um, you know property advocates who have a great relationship with PMC Property. Um, you know we, we, we've got you know debt specialists, my debt advisor. We have uh, a whole raft of businesses that work with us that provide the gaps. Um, and one thing that we've done differently this year is, you know, we have um, we have town hall meetings. Um, you know, we have, no way. Yeah. So we have we have these kind of, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's cool, yeah. man. We have these sessions that we run. We run Q and A's. This year we've just done Q and A's as opposed to set presentations. Mm. And you know, we, we 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 go out to our member base. We have about uh, I think two thousand seven hundred fifty odd members that we have yeah, now in right. Wealth Hub. We go out to the member base and let them know where they're going to be, what we're talking about. Yes. That format's been so much more successful than a traditional let's come talk about what's going on and, and all the rest. So we have typically three subject matter experts and we weave the messages in together. Yeah. Uh, the last one we did was on um, retirement. Yep. And it was about retiring, but not the way you would think. We had a real life retiree talking about oh, their journey. That's cool, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. How and did you get someone to say that they're comfortable sharing their story yeah well, well mick, is, mick is, is a guy i worked with years ago um and he's been uh six years retired and he thought he was financially secured yep. he was fit as you know fit as fit can be yep. um you know indestructible and was just gonna go on being you know mick and you know life's life's great he got really crook oh no he had two or three life-changing events within a couple of years oh, of retiring no. Um, you know, financially, you know, obviously markets go up and down yes. and all the rest. Um, so, you know, he had to reevaluate how he wants to, to, to live. Um, kids have moved out of home. Yeah. So, you know, is the big house what I wanted? I didn't expect to have to make those decisions. So he was very candid. And, and the people that came along were like, 
geez, that's that's kind of me. That's that, or that could be me. Yes, we had a nutritionist come along yep. talking about really you know, the, the the physical kind of issues that you'll be facing as you approach retirement. And when you're there, you know, it's about you know not just the physical, but then obviously the mental. You know, yeah. how to how to you know captivate your mind while you're in retirement. You know, what are you doing? What, what purpose do you have? Yeah, you know, most people they will work up to retirement, and you know it'll be a very fulfilling world because you know you're going to work you clock on you clock off and yeah. you know you've got purpose in between but to go home and then to suddenly think um you know you you, you don't really have that purpose anymore man what it's, do you do with your time absolutely like um figuring out why uh to get up in the morning is mm. can be really difficult yeah. for people who retire yeah and, and and mick kind of you know cut off um, the lady escapes me now. Who's uh, Victoria? Victoria Blackett was. Um, she uh, she was talking about this, and Mick cut in and said, "You know what? For nine months, I thought this was the best life ever. After nine <laughs> months, I was like, what the hell am yeah. I doing with myself? Yeah. And actually, what what was he doing? Nothing." Yeah, God. He was finding he was finding he was finding things to do to take up his time so yeah. his wife wasn't um, on his back about what he had or hadn't done for the day. And before he knew it, you know, three thirty, four o'clock, his wife came home and she was asking why the rubbish hadn't been taken out. He's like, mm, I've got to find things to do to fill my time so I don't get in trouble for not taking the rubbish out. Yeah. So like it's things like that. And then and then we had Mark kind of bringing it together around, you know, what are the financial elements um you need to be considerate of? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if if you're retiring thinking you're going to be relying on the pension, you know, what does that mean? Mm. How much is the pension? You know, does is, is this realistically what you can live on? You know, looking at uh I wrote an article a couple uh, last week uh talking about um retirees entering uh pre-retirees moving towards retirement without a handbrake. Now the, the reality is if you're not aware of your spending leading into retirement and you think you're going to spend X amount in retirement, how do you know those two numbers actually even coexist? Yeah. Um, you know, you need to be across your spending before you can go to retirement thinking that this ex- is exactly what you need. So the yes. sooner you get a control of your spending, the better off you can be. So, you know, Mark brings to life a lot of the, you know, the financial elements to it. So between the financial, um, the, the physical and emotional pieces uh, moving to retirement and then what actually happens once you get there. Um, you know, we had I think about 30 or 40 people in the audience. Um, they're like, oh, okay, that's, that's an eye-opener. And then, yeah. then we can engage off the back of that. Yeah, it's um, it's such a weird thing, financial advice, mm-hmm. and it, because it does it does bleed into those areas, as you said, health, yep. um, and, and purpose. Yep. Um, what what gave you the idea to to do this? That that's that's because because it's it, another another way to look at it is corporate wellness. Yep. In that, yep. Yeah. So, um. In in my opinion, from what I've seen, it's something that people think about doing but don't really do. Mm. And then you guys come along, you're, you're like, okay, we're we're we're, yeah. we're doing this in this way, and 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 you use education, and you've got depending on engagement, different levels yep. that, that that people can get involved. So if 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 there's advisors out there and they're they're thinking they want to sort of start connecting with people because what you've just said is you give people a journey, an educational journey, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people probably listening that have wanted to do things like blogs and wanted to do, you know, maybe they did one or two and they're on their, they're on their website, but they, they didn't get a substantial result in a short amount of time and they gave up and they're sort of just sitting there on the website yeah. from two, three years ago, right? You know, yeah. um, how, how did you decide, you know, how did you make that decision um, to, to actually do this and stick to it and, and turn it into what you've turned it into so yeah. far? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I suppose the catalyst was understanding that um, in the corporate super world, um, business had done the same thing for a long time but really hadn't achieved any different results. And there was a significant opportunity in an advice firm to engage differently. And one of the best things I saw when I was on corporate world is all these great initiatives that weren't being introduced into people's practices. Um and I think at a, at a business level, the reason why they weren't being introduced is because most principals don't have the time to implement these things and they don't have the resources. Um, if they have the resources, they're being stretched because typically most planning firms, are, um, they, run, they run pretty thin. 
and they don't have the the ability to do that. Mm. The only people that would be able to build something like that, like what we've done, is businesses that saw that you know a you need to do things differently and had the had the ability to invest in a resource like me my, my role was to come in initially as a general manager and to reposition um a, a dorm i suppose a dormant at the time a dormant um a risk focused business and a corporate super business for the future so we did a whole bunch of work there to start with but then built your wealth hub as a result of seeing there was so much really cool stuff sitting on the outside that wasn't being brought together. And a lot of what I've done is to bring those great tools and concepts and ideas together, wrap them up into your wealth hub, taking a whole heap of statistics out to corporates, to CFOs and HR directors to say, hey, this is your problem. Your problem you need to solve is the fact that in the workplace, there is wastage because your staff are bringing financial stress into the office. Mm. It's not just impacting them, but it's impacting the staff that sit around them. Someone needs to say, stop, we can help you. And the logical place to do it is in the workplace as opposed to try to bottom up outside. Um, yeah, you look at the tools, some of the tools the banks deliver. There's some great initiatives. There's a lot of money spent on advertising and marketing. It's mass advertising through mainstream media, you know, radio, TV, um, and the strike rates aren't fantastic for these great initiatives and great tools and, and, and they kind of wonder why, how do we engage better? Mm. It seemed only logical that the workplace was the way to do it. So so back to kind of into the workplaces, you speak to um, HR directors and they love the fact that they can make a difference and improve the productivity of their staff by taking a vested interest in their financial wellness. If you give people the ability to have a choice around how they solve their problems, they're less likely to be doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And on average, people will spend, who are financially stressed, 40% of the, of the population, working population, uh, they'll spend an hour a day doing things they shouldn't be doing, whether that's you know, daydreaming or on the internet trying to find a solution or looking at the next way to get rich, to get themselves out of these issues. You know, financial stress is real. It doesn't matter which way you kind of package it up, it's very real. Spending an hour a day means there's a dollar figure you can quantify it with. Yeah. And we created an equation through some of the research from Canada and, and America and the UK, which just sits on our website, where you can put your average um, sorry, you can put your average salary in with the number of people in your business and work out the wastage in your business. Wow. When, when we started showing CFOs that, because you know, as much as HR directors love the the fluffy, you know, we want to help your staff and you can make an interest, you can become an employer of choice, and we can we can make a real difference in their world, and you know, you're not going to have as much staff turnover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You start show the CFOs, and they're like, "Sounds great, but how much does it cost?" Yeah, and, and it's, it's just it's straight yeah. away, straight away the door's closing. You can feel it. Yes, uh, and then you show them the wastage, and they're yeah. like, "Hmm." So you're saying if I could reduce the wastage, and that could in turn, you know, convert into a higher productivity rate. Yeah, you know, the question is, you know, what would that do to your business if you could do that? And then you get all the fluffy stuff that sits on the outside, and then that's where people start looking at it and take it seriously. So yeah. Well, that's, that's the journey, mate. Because <clears throat> I think you've got a, a pretty unique skill set. On one hand, you're um, you're a finance guy, and then you love to to go surfing and yeah. play music and travel and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I w I'd I'd like to duck into just you for a second. Sure. So you uh, spend about a month uh, in in Bali, yeah, down maybe, south, yeah. surfing the the awesome swell there, and. That's not even your your um, your holiday time. So, how how did you do this? Because that's you know that's one of those things in life that many people wish they could do. So, what who who did you have to convince <laughs> to, in order to make this happen? Yeah, um, yeah. Look, uh, the the vision, I suppose, to be able to work remotely. Um, you know, needs a number of factors to come into play. Obviously, you know, Mark, or business partner, obviously has to be comfortable that we both can do it. Mark works for four weeks from Italy. I work for four weeks or five weeks from from Bali. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do this together. Um, from an operational perspective, we've set the business up where we have, you know, all our client-facing activity done out of North Sydney and non-client-facing activities done out of the Philippines, so all our database back office stuff. Yep. Um, so first and foremost, with everything process-driven and everyone's very clear on what they should and shouldn't be doing, it makes it a lot easier. Mm. The technology piece is, is the enabler, obviously, that's going to mean you can and can't do what you want to do. So 
for me, in the morning uh, in Bali on, on any given day, I'll wake up at 5.30, uh, check emails and do probably an hour or, or, or two in the morning, um, do what I need to do that may finish off the day before and uh, maybe go for a surf. Yeah, right. So that's, that's, that's not a bad thing. That's awesome. Come back, uh, you know, do the same thing. I might be having a, a, a Zoom meeting with staff members, so we try to try to do that. Every Monday morning was a sales meeting. You know, the times were still met. I yep. was up a little earlier. Yeah, uh, I was in a, a little bit of time in Java this time, so rather than being up at you know six, I was up at five. But you know, it all still worked, and it was as if I was still sitting in North Sydney. What? So from from Mark, Mark Mark's perspective and, and my perspective, you know, you know, the, the agreement and kind of the vision was that. We be able to pick up and be able to do this if we were committed to the cause. Yes, um, and, and, and that's what we that's what we wanted to do, and that's what we've been able to achieve. Technology is enabled absolutely, you know, and probably five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do it in Bali because the, the the way the speed of the internet would work. <laughs> yeah. uh, but interestingly, I did. Uh, this, this is this is funny. Um, I was in uh, Central Java, south of Jogjakarta, on the coast. And uh, I had to do some trimming for a, a podcast that I had done right. and upload the video to YouTube. Yep. And a video that would usually take, you know, a couple of minutes here, I, I swear, took about 10 or 12 seconds to upload what? over there. Yeah, what? Yeah. And I was like, this is insane. What? This is insane. Anyway, worked worked really, really quick. I don't know how it happened. Oh, I think and, they must have stolen our MBN. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where the finished pieces are. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's crazy. But um, yeah, look, I think I think for any any business entity that thinks that this is important to them, you know, I, I hate winter. I love being in the warmth. So for mm. me, a big driver is that. Big driver is you know being there when the swell's good. So I I do have the flexibility about to do it, but it's also having the discipline to know that when you need to work, you need to work. Yeah. Um. You know, having great Zoom connection, having good internet so you can run Zoom and have video conferences. Um, I think if you set the expectation with your clients and people around you that this is the accepted way we're going to engage, no one questions it. Yeah. But if you don't have the discipline to make it work and you let things slip and all that type of stuff, um, that, um, uh, you know, I, I suppose that, that, um, that point of reference around the relationship that you've you've wanted to set and the tone you've set for the relationship obviously starts to be eroded. So, yeah, you just have to follow through to make sure you're actually doing the right thing. And so, when you, when you say uh, your staff and you're you're having Zoom meetings, mm. is this uh, is the like how much how many Australian staff do you have? Uh, we've got uh, ten in the office now. In North ten City. in the office, and are they mostly financial planners. There's three financial planners and then support staff. Wow. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, and and so in the three years that you've been doing this, yeah. um, ha, how much of that is growth or, or was that the size of the business that you launched at day one? Yeah, no, no. We, we, we've we had, so we had, you know, we have Strictly Super, we have Nolan Co, we have Your Wealth Hub and we have our own license, which I run. Yeah. So I sit across the four business entities. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a few hats there. Yes. Um, you know, Half the staff sit within Nolan Co. Half sit within Strictly Super, and we have extracts that kind of work across your Wealth Hub yep. at different points. So you know, I, I build the education. Um, Steve in the office also helps build the education, and then we go out and deliver that to our corporate super clients or our yep. clients um, in your Wealth Hub who work directly with us. Yep. Um, it's not through a corporate super relationship; it's that they've actually sought out a wellness program to run in their business. So it's a bit different. So we all kind of have a hand in working together in some way in those entities. And what, what, what do the other entities do? The other entities? Yeah. So as in uh, like uh, Vinarc is in yes, our license. Yes. So that, that's our A for self. Is, is, is it, but is it just you guys or do you have other practices under that A for self? Okay. In, is that something that you're interested in doing? Yeah, yeah. So what would you be looking for in a – in a practice. Yeah, look, I've, I have a vision around licensees need to f- fundamentally change. I think the model at the moment is, is, is somewhat broken and I think we're going to see more information come to hand about how broken, I suppose, the regulator thinks that the, yeah, they actually are. Yep. And I think the interim report that comes out uh, from the Royal Commission end of September will be indicative, I suppose, of what we'll see in February with the full report coming out. But yes. um, I think fundamentally licensee models need to change. I think there's there's two layers of engagement in the licensee model that um, we all need to be aware of. There's the there's the, the must-haves, the non-negotiables and the core. I, I call it the core and that's really around four areas. It's around remuneration and distribution. It's around education it's around compliance, and it's um, it's around. She's test me on the last one. Um, <laughs> ed- education, uh, uh, compliance, uh, remuneration, 
and oh, um, uh, 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 compliance documentation. So right, right. Yep. What you do around around audits and all that type of stuff. And I think at a core, licensees need to do that stuff really bloody well. Mm. But what what tends to happen in licensee land is for the best part, and, and there are some good ones, and there are obviously ones that obviously are just doing the basics. But typically, what I've seen over the years is that you will. Be treated in a business entity or an individual, uh, you, you'll be wanting to work to the to the midpoint. And if you sit outside the midpoint, something that's controllable, um, a lot of compliance and legal that sit behind these entities get very nervous because you sit outside the norm, yes. too far to the left, too far to the right. They get a little concerned. They really want everyone just to be doing the same thing. Yep. But if you have an, a creative license to want to do things differently and engage through a financial wellness program or, mm. or do things differently, you know they get a little bit nervous because it's it's all oh, this is different. We don't know how to do this. This is this is unusual. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we can remain in control and we don't see any risk. And I, and I get the risk protection part. I think that's I think that's very important. But largely, if you're a big practice that's been a big practice for a long time and want to grow but the majority of people in your licensee are largely you know, mid-sized businesses when you start bouncing ideas off your peers you look around and you realize very quickly that there isn't many of those people there so then the question is where do you go what do you do yeah and i think that's why i think last year the figure was nine percent of advisors moved into a, a, an own fsl environment that's massive isn't it's it massive and it's only Whoa. a sign of things to things to come on top of the core, which is what, you know, the basics, I think then there that's where you have the real value. Yes. And I think this this kind of co-op model that I've I've been kind of building in my mind and, and, and putting under paper is is having like minded businesses that want to come together. The businesses that are the outliers but have a common vision and common values. Um, they come together and they not only appreciate that they need to be better at delivering service to their clients, but understand and realize that perhaps their model may not be best practice. Yep. And there is benefit in sharing those ideas with other businesses. So creating a hub where you have best practice that's continually being evolved and refined, um, having documentation created in a central place at a, at a low cost rather than having an expensive resource that you know may be taking more time and a higher amount to, to basically execute. Yes. But having that type of service delivery managed in the office but having the documentation production in a central place, it's about having a proper business coaching. It's tailored to an mm. individual. If you have like-minded people, you can get the best, best business coach to work on six businesses as opposed to one. Very um, good point. If you have, you know, if you want to do something a little bit different left field, if you want to take um if you want to take your proposition to a new market, building the best of breed marketing programs, you know, having the best social media experts working with you, you know, the, the marketing results, mm. all those things. So if you can take those best of kind of conversations and have them as a value add in the license, but you've got the people involved that only are looking forward and they're in pure growth mode yes. uh, together, you know, the economies of scale there mean you can succeed. So that, that new license model is not just about doing the core stuff reasonably well, it's about doing the core stuff bloody well every time, but that's just the starting point. Yes. It's all about looking forward and ensuring that you know the, the common vision and, and the values align to the best possible outcome to clients, constantly looking for new ways of engaging so you can help reduce the cost to your client for that service delivery, but you as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a business owner, are doing the absolute best and more all the time. And I think, you know, it's it's a big statement. It's 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 a it's a big goal, but I think you need to start somewhere. And I think that best of breed kind of efficiency piece is at the heart of that value add piece. And where are you getting your support from? Like who who's who who are you talking with to to be able to deliver everything that it is that you want to deliver? Yeah. So my peers. So um, I I chair the leaders forum for the AFA, so yes. National Chair for Leaders Forum. You've been doing that for quite some time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, since inception, so four or five years yeah, wow. now. So yeah, it's 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 a small number of groups and you know, I have I have my peers that are in there that we bounce ideas off. Yeah. Uh, and we get to talk about what's happening and you know what's happening from a legislative perspective, what's happening from um, a service delivery perspective, you know, what are the common issues that we're facing. Yeah. And you know, it was only I met up with one of the, the guys today before I came here. Um, and I was just highlighting that, you know, what I said early on, you know, one of the common issues in a lot of these practices is that um, the ideas are plentiful, but the implementation isn't. So it's all about understanding how you yes. actually implement a lot of these. So 
you know, again, that peer group and having you know, good people around to say, well, have you done this? Have you tried this? You know, what, what would it look like? Yes. What mistakes did you make? Um, I think the benefit of sharing that information isn't just the wins, it's the stuff that didn't work and the reasons why it didn't work um, and understanding that the speed humps, you know, some are necessary uh, to make sure you get best product, best practice, but um, other times you can avoid a lot of the stuff you, you can avoid and they could be common things. So if we can eliminate that stuff and, and, and mean that we've got you know, a clear path to where we need to be, I think you know, we're, we're all heading in the right direction together. Yeah, man. That, that's been, um, I think with financial planning being at such a sensitive position, uh, there is so much sharing mm. of information going on. And it, it's, I, I just don't know. I, I can't imagine any other industry being as dedicated to helping the positive evolution, as we say at XY, yeah. the positive evolution of financial advice, um, because we want to make sure that we choose the direction yeah. of where financial advice is headed. And what do you think? Like, do you think that the legislation will get rewritten so that financial advice is decoupled from product at, at a legislative? Uh, I, I, I just, no matter how many times I think about it, I always come back to at, at, its, at its legal core, mm. it's seen as the same thing, yep. that advice and product is seen as the same thing. And then you've got all these Band-Aids over the top, best interest duty and FOFR and everything, which, you know, it's done it's done its job and it's done a good job. But if you keep digging, you come back to yep. product advice is linked at a legislative um, level. So imagine if that gets rewritten. Imagine after the RC that one of the core findings is, we we uh, decouple <coughs> financial advice from product. Um, what are some things, and and is this something that the the that your group of leaders um, are doing at the AFA? Are you guys thinking about ways to help um, direct those those changes? Like, are you getting involved at at, at any sort of lobbying level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to your first point around leading the journey for financial advice, mm. I think as a profession and previously as an industry, um, I think we've been pretty poor at leading that conversation. Yeah. I think we've allowed product manufacturers and regulation and, and, and people waving the sticks at leading where we should go. And I, I don't think that's a viable um, and sustainable way of, of, of kind of perpetuating ourselves. You know, we, we, we do such a great job. Our profession helps so many people, yet we don't lead our own it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's a really strange thing. Yeah. And you're right. Yeah. You know, we share because proportionately there's so many more people that could use our support mm. than who actually receive it now. So it makes absolute sense that, you know, you know, for us we work together as opposed to work against each other. Yeah. Um and, and I think, you know, that there's a there's 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 a piece of dialogue alone in that. You know, we do need to be working together uh, to share the value advice, but we also need to be respectful that not everyone wants to move down a full advice relationship. Yep. Um, and I think in that, um, I think we've come unstuck in the past because we've just tried to hunt clients to move down our standard relationship yeah. um, without understanding that there needs to be a you know, tiered engagement model um, and at some point you're going to have to say no to some clients because they just don't fit your demographic and that that no gives you more respect than saying yes and trying to squeeze them in. And we've seen obviously what's happened when, 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 when that conversation goes astray. So mm. I think I think from that perspective, we do need to lead the conversation, and I think we're getting much better. And movements like like this, I think, mm. you know, show a much more proactive and positive message to show to to consumers about what advice can do to support. So I'll, I'll just say that just first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, what are we doing by way of uh, lobbying and engaging and trying to lead? Absolutely. So the whole the ethos. Of of the leaders forum is that we can take some of the thinking that's distilled at a national level when our leaders get together we, we, we try to get together once a year 
um, in our national summit. Our next one's will be in March or May next year. It hasn't quite landed which, which time period it will be. But the idea is, is that we take that thinking and distill that back through the community. Right. And to the point before around, you know, licensees, um, you know, they have outliers and they have people that outgrow the license because they're either growing too fast, too quick. Um, they look around and if they don't have any peers around, they need to find somewhere. So that's where I think the industry bodies have a great opportunity to, yeah. to um, bring those people together. And that's why, you know, through the AFA, we've been able to create leaders. Um so when we get together, we, we think of some really cool stuff. We get some really interesting speakers that come together, um, you know, be it you know, financially focused, non-financially focused. Mm. Um, we had a great session a couple of years ago from Jeff Kennett about, you know, leadership through adversity. Um, you know, he's had some challenging roles over the years and taking, you know, the things that he said, you know, that he's had five fingers of, of five finger principles of um, of leadership, taking them back and how we introduce those into our businesses. And the concept is, is that through, you know, 35 different leaders coming together, they can then go out to their own communities in each state and, and their own circles and share the outcomes of that. I know the AFA has already used that a couple of times with um, some of their sessions. I think two years ago, the national conference theme came out of Leaders Forum Think Tank. Um, so it, it is taking the biggest, brightest um, firms understanding what we need to do collectively from a legislative level, from an emotional and a client engagement level, mm. you know, what is the experience that we're trying to achieve? Um, and, and one of the one of the topics that we had a couple of years ago was um, understanding what advice would look like five years from now. This was two years ago. So in three years' time, we're going to see what we discussed come to fruition. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to go back to, to see how and what we do. Well, what, what, of that. Let, let me in on it. Yeah. What, what, what did you predict? Yeah, so... The I suppose the key key outcomes from there were there was, there was probably two or three that were, were of interest for us. Um, one is that advice is going to look advice delivery is going to look very different, and I think at that stage we started to predict the uh, decoupling or uh, of um, vertical integration. Yep. And I think institutional ownership, and we've already seen um, this year the majority of institutions. Um, you know, kind of flag that their intention of having distribution with product is is ceasing, and and businesses are quickly moving away from um, life insurance. You know, from banks, we're seeing a lot of movement in that space. Largest amount of acquisitions we've seen in the last um, you know five or ten years uh, with with businesses kind of moving away that way. Yeah. Um, the same with licensee land, you're seeing a lot of consolidation, and then as I said before, the nine percent number of um, you know AFSLs that have have started. So that's the first first and foremost. I think. Uh, the second one was interesting, and that's kind of along the lines of you know, talking about this co-op you know, model where you've got like-minded businesses banding together, sharing back office services and trying to yeah. s- try to create efficiency by scaling up centrally, yep. which I think was, I think is a really big part as well. Um, uh, one of the areas that you know, was emerging at the time was, the, was, was SMAs, um, looking at managed accounts and how they actually work. And, and that's obviously proves to be beneficial for a number of different reasons. There's, there's a lot of efficiency at a, at a practice level, yeah. which, which helps. Um, but down the track, the way we, I suppose, were thinking about the evolution of, of Robo, um, and even back then, Robo was seen as, in, 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 in those four walls back then, Robo was seen as, as a way of engaging a client base that we weren't able to engage before. I don't think from leaders it was ever seen as a threat to clients, and, and I still honestly believe that Robo will be an enabler for people to understand more about their yeah. own situation. I don't think it's a threat at all. I, in fact, I welcome it. And I think the more that some of the big brands can spend on getting these tools, which are fantastic, yeah. into the mainstream, inevitably people will effectively ask questions and they will want more than what's in front of them. I think that's where people who are firmly focused on delivering a great service outcome and and really want to work with clients, uh, I think that's where Robo will come in and and play as an entree into an advice relationship. So the key themes, the key themes there. That's a very good point. And, And just on that, so, do you guys use any robo in your engagement? Yeah, so we have Map My Plan. Oh, uh, you do. Yeah. I'm sitting here the whole yeah, time yeah, you were yeah. talking, going, Map My Plan would yeah. be perfect for you guys. Yeah, so we we launched our second <laughs> tier, a version 2.0, um, in June this year. Yeah, so we're early days, um, and we bought on a whole range of new services. So we've got Spriggy for children's banking. We've got Map yeah, My Plan. Spriggy. Got, I've I've yeah. heard of this. Yeah, children's banking. It's a, it's a cool app. Kids get their cards. Yeah. Parents can monitor what they're doing. Yeah. Allocate funds. 
Um, really cool. Very simple. That very is. Easy. I think I saw about that for the first time in FinCon in America mm. a couple of years ago. Mm. Right. So you're using that. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So we're engaging. So we're, so when it comes to you know how to engage, that's how to teach really kids money, cool, man. Check out Spriggy. Yeah. yeah. How's this? We had um. Do you know uh, Andrew Rocks from yeah, the announcer group? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so one of the yeah, co- one of the leaders for him is he? Yeah, I yeah. Knew, I yeah, had yeah. it in my mind that he would as well. <laughs> so, one of the things that he talks about that he does is um, uh, to connect with parents is to do non financial events yeah. uh, such as uh, CPR courses yeah, for, yeah. for the mums and dads, and then have different nights for mums yeah. and dads and. Um, there's all these little things that I think are getting worked really well. So it's great to hear that yeah. someone's using Spriggy as yeah, well. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Roxy's. Uh, we'll talk, talk about Roxy very quickly. Yeah, Roxy's always had a very, very futuristic view of the world, and I've, I've known him for a long time. He's our life. version of Elon Musk. He's yeah, the yeah. fragile planning yeah, Elon yeah, Musk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I remember working with Roxy when he was. Uh, it was just him and his business partner at the no time. No way. Out of uh, out of Surrey Hills. Um, Interesting. So you know, he's, he's grown a fantastic business, and you know, he's always looking for new ways to engage. And I, I love the fact that he sees that you know you don't have to talk about finances to you know engage people and, and earn trust. You mm. know? It is all about that holistic thinking about you know what's important to someone. And you know what, if it's to do with kids and you know, understanding you know if something if the worst was to happen, you know, have yeah. a CPR class. That's fantastic. Love it. Good work, Roxy. Absolutely. And so uh, Spriggy, Map My Plan. Yeah. Um, a raise, which is the old. Right. Raise, yep, using that as yep, well. Very yep. cool. We use Wiser Credit, which Wider, is a credit. I'm unfamiliar with yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's a credit consolidation service. Right. Uh, so it's, it's it's really designed um, for um, yeah, people with multiple credit card debts and they can't get on top of it. They consolidate it at a low interest rate and um, uh, right. they're doing a great job. They're a really good business. Interesting. Okay. So all of these things are, are, are robo esque. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, tech, fintech. It's, it's fintech, fintech. Yes. Combination of robo. Um, but yeah, yeah. We, we have a we have Discover three six five in there as well, which is a, a travel business. So again, it's, it's going on the lifestyle really? the lifestyle sign side of things. Um, Man, that's so cool. Yeah, and Care three sixty, which is which is a, a new um, uh, aged care service. It's yep. kind of like an Uber for aged care. It's very cool. Get out of town. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Whoa, mate, um, I could actually spend a lot more time <laughs> finding out more, uh, but we've, we've come up to the, the end of our time. So, um, mate, thank you so much for coming on yeah, no and worries, um, congratulations. It's, it's been great to w- at least watch it from afar, the growth of this business. So um, it was awesome to find out a bit more about it and uh, be great to have you back on sometime. Yeah, thank you. Great to spend some time with you. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks a lot.